Welcome, everybody, uh, to the Empowered Living Club's first um, regular monthly meeting. Um, we're really proud to be setting off in, in this direction, and we're very happy and glad that you joined us. Uh, today is Wednesday, May 18th, uh, 2022. It is 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we're doing a live recording. Uh, it will be posted uh, for those who want to see it again, those who aren't able to make it, or those uh, who uh, couldn't join us for uh, other reasons, uh, scheduling or whatever. Um, the topic of today's presentation is how to store your healthcare documents. Or as you can see here on the slide, the question is, will your healthcare documents work when you need them to? How to store your documents. So um, with that, uh, and, and on behalf of uh, Golder Care uh, and Andrea, uh, we, we welcome you. Presenters today are myself, so Golder Care is, is involved in this presentation. Uh, myself uh, from Golder Care, Kathy Nitz, although Kathy is under the weather, so I will uh, do her uh, piece for her. Andrea Lashak is a, uh, is a new addition uh, to our club and uh, a, a resource, a brand new resource for the club members. We're very, very happy and very proud to have her on board. We'll talk a little bit more about her, uh, but the presentation is primarily about uh, storing legal or storing uh, healthcare documents. But we will uh, talk a little bit more about her and, um, and where we're going with uh, some of the things that she may be doing with us in the future. Uh, and then Gail Glockoff Long, who just welcomed you uh, with, with Golder Care, and she will be talking as well. So that's your presenters. Let's get right into it. Uh, healthcare documents. There's a lot of different types of healthcare documents. This is not an exhaustive list, and it can change from state to state because individual states have different legislation. Uh, so you can see powers of attorney, of course, one of your big uh, issues. Living wills have been a, an issue for the last 40 or 50 years. Um, declarations for mental health treatment, okay? Those are unfortunately not often uh, utilized and they really should be because mental health records and treatment is, is uh, highly specialized and a normal healthcare power of attorney will ordinarily not be enough for that. Uh, posts, MOLSTs, IPOSTs, things like that. A POLST is uh, an acronym for a physician orders regarding life sustaining treatment, or now some places call it practitioner orders. So it's not always just a, a, a physician. A MOLST is a medical order regarding life sustaining treatment. And an IPOST is an Iowa um, physician's orders regarding the scope of treatment. So they're the same kind of a thing. They're all fairly new within the last, say, 10, 15 years. And uh, those are actually medical orders. We'll, we'll talk about that. A DNR, similarly, do not resuscitate, is a medical order. HIPAA consents and authorizations. Many of you know uh, or have heard of HIPAA. HIPAA is the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, spelled with two A's and not with two P's. Uh, and that comes from about 1995 or 96. It has some good aspects, but it's also been a real pain and has, in many respects, I think, held us back. Donor registry cards, for instance, okay? Uh, I have one of those for the Iowa Donor Registry, and uh, that can uh, access uh, the medical authorities at the time of my death to documents on store with the state of Iowa, which can override even my uh, family's uh, objections to uh, uh, to organ donation. Uh, health insurance cards are one potential. A COVID-19 vaccination record card. We're not here to talk about healthcare documents. We're not here to talk about how they work. We're not here to talk about all the different types, but uh, we're here to talk about how to store them. But some of the differences do come into play and they will be mentioned from time to time. So as I say, there is a little variation. Some of them are primarily legal documents and some of them are primarily medical documents or actually medical orders. So the POLST is a medical order that, uh, uh, that the paramedics can rely on 
uh, if they come to the house and they're otherwise required to do resuscitation. If the pulse says they don't have to, they can rely on that. Whereas they can't always rely on some of the other documents. Um, the legal documents, uh, probably primarily, as we see, these are primarily healthcare documents. The reason many of them ended up in, in law offices was because there was no third party payer uh, source to pay the medical professionals and therefore they wouldn't do them. And they all ended up in, in lawyer's offices. So uh, some of the documents are more legal uh, and some of them are more uh, medical. There are some of the documents that we refer to informally as working originals, okay? So there are a few like the polls where you usually have the original stored on say a refrigerator or in a freezer, okay? So they may have, some of them require the original document, although posts are infamous for getting lost and you do wanna have copies and oftentimes they will follow the copies. Uh, similarly, you'll see a standard location versus many have no standard, okay? So your legal documents are effective wherever they are, it's just you have to get them to, to where they need to be. Um, so at this point, um, uh, I've been talking recently with Andrea and uh, she has a story that really is, is directly uh, uh, relevant to the topic today. And uh, I'm going to ask her to tell that. Uh, you can see here that Andrea is a uh, board certified geriatric pharmacist, as well as a patient advocate. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the ways that she and we may be working together, both in older care and in the Empowered Living uh, Club. So this is a little bit about uh, her and I'll let Andrea tell her story. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Very good, awesome, thank you. Um, this topic resonates, it is so personal to me. In 2018, my sister and I um, had invited my father to come to the beach with us. And he said he didn't wanna come, that you know there was just gonna be too many people and he wanted to stay home. Uh, so my sister and I went to Florida and unbeknownst to us, he had such severe sleep apnea that he was going hypoxic at night. And we didn't know this. He was single, he lived alone. You know, we knew he snored, but we weren't quite aware of how severe. So we're sitting on the beach and we get a phone call from an emergency room in Tennessee. And we're down on, I think it's the forgotten coast of Florida. No easy way to get to. And my dad's in the ER. He drove himself because he knew something wasn't right. He was hallucinating. And they, he actually was wandering around the parking lot um, looking for help. So now he's in the emergency department and we're literally sitting under an umbrella on a beach. So we're talking to the nurse. They're assuring us that he's safe and okay. We're trying to figure out how quickly does somebody need to try to get back? Do I need to drive immediately? Um, you know, and try to make the 12 hour journey. And they're like, no, no, he's fine. We're gonna hold him overnight. And I said, well, okay, we have medical power of attorney. We have all this. Um, as soon as I get back to Tennessee, I can get this to you. Because 2018, I wasn't traveling with these documents. Um, and they're like, that's fine. <laughs> You're good. We'll keep him overnight. We'll get him a room. We went to bed. The next morning we wake up and there's a message on the phone and they've transferred him. So we called to the hospital and they're like, we can't speak about him. And I was like, what do you mean? You can't speak about him. He was there last night. You said you were going to get him a bed. And they said, well, we can't tell you where he is. To which point now the panic sets in, but they're, they're like, he's alive, but we can't tell you. So finally, some frantic phone calls, we found out what they had done because he was older, because he was displaying signs of a dementia or a cognitive impairment, they actually transferred him to a mental health facility in the middle of the night and didn't no notify anybody after they had told us they were going to keep him overnight. So, you know, in the shock and the panic and the anger, I called my dad's attorney Thank goodness the legal assistant was in the office, was able to fax the documents and take care of this. And four hours later, I was, it was confirmed what hospital, because I assumed he was in one of two, um, they confirmed and I finally had a power to be able to speak with the doctors and everything like that. But if that person had not been in the office, I have no clue 
what we would have done. I mean, it's not like I knew that the attorney's office, I mean, like home address to go knock on the doors you know, or something. I mean, we had the documents in our house, but we weren't there. So that's what happened to us. <laughs> yeah, that's um, pretty scary and uh, not something you expect to happen every day. Mm -mm. Uh, and it also involves, as we were just mentioning, the issue at times of uh, mental health documents. Uh, and treatment preferences. You know, mm -hmm. do I want psychotropic drugs? Do I want uh, electroshock if it comes to that, or or those sorts of things? So there's all sorts of of special provisions and even tighter provisions than HIPAA when it comes to mental health rules. So I think we can all, uh, if that and otherwise, at least in our imaginations, we can all relate to uh, Andrea's story and. Um, uh, we're, as I say, we're going to be working with uh, Andrea. So for those of you who are able and willing, uh, if you wait till the end of the presentation, we will talk briefly at that time about uh, some more that we will be doing with Andrea. So uh, just you know, before we wrap up today. So getting back to uh, onto the, the, the track, um, the original question here is how can you make sure that your advanced directive, whatever your healthcare document is available and will be followed in case of a medical emergency. And when we say will be followed, that means will you be recognized and be given information? If you have to make, uh, or, um, or your agent, I should say, if your agent has to make decisions, will those be recognized or not? So that's the question that got DocuBank and other document banks started. And we're gonna talk about that today. This is an educational presentation. We're not trying to sell any particular uh, service, but uh, we will be, uh, as you know, talking about DocuBank. It is not the only document bank that is out there, uh, but it's the one that um, the uh, Empowered Living Club has, um, has, has struck a, a relationship with. So the dilemma, how can you organize and store your documents to maximize both their immediate availability, as we saw in Andrea's story, but also their security and physical safety, which you've always wanted you know, over time so that documents don't get lost. We see that happen all the time too. Don't know where it is, don't know what happened to it, et cetera, et cetera. Next one. So there are more questions. Is there one way you can do it? Or as you see, we skip down. Are there multiple ways to do it? Can, is it kind of a, a spectrum with security on one end and availability on the other, you kind of got to balance, and prioritize, or do we have to do multiple things in order to get those two goals met? So how best to optimize the way or ways uh, that we store our healthcare docs? So here we see again, uh, you know, security, immediate accessibility, or both. Well, I would suggest we want both, all right? We don't want it lost. Uh, because I was carrying it uh, around in my glove compartment or somewhere on the floor of the car, and it somehow blew out of the car or something. So uh, we want it physically safe and secure. We want it safe from physical destruction by, say, fire, flood, things like that. We also want it secure from the foibles of, of us human beings. Uh, we don't want it taken away or torn up by others or defaced. Uh, we don't want to lose it or misfile it. Uh, we don't want people who we don't want to see it to see it, okay? Uh, unwanted disclosures. So that's the security and the safety side. The immediate accessibility side, we want it available when it's needed, particularly in the case of a medical emergency. We want it ready to hand. Uh, we'd like immediate, essentially immediate retrieval for medical emergencies and also for other uh, medical events. So, but we also want it to be legally or medically and medically recognized so that it will be given full force and effect. We want it to be effective and we want it to be available to the right agents and care providers and yet protected from non-authorized access. So that's really what we're looking for. That's the, that's the goal of, of healthcare uh, document organization and storage. Here's a whole bunch of storage things that, that, that we see over time, and this is not an exhaustive list. I just mentioned number two, you know, I could store things in my car to try to make them more, um, more available, not real secure, but, um, but 
try to make them more available. But if I go to the hospital in an ambulance and my car is somewhere else, that's not going to help. Uh, so some people carry things uh, in their wallet or purse. Uh, some people keep a copy at home in their business records or the originals. Uh, we've had a number of people over the years who use home safes, strong boxes. Some people do store them in the refrigerator or freezer. Uh, as I mentioned, the posts usually are specified that they should be uh, retained on the refrigerator door. Those documents are usually for people as they get uh, further along in uh, their disease process, they get closer to death, and uh, they're usually for sicker people. And you keep that that physician's order right on the refrigerator door. So if the authorities come to uh, take you uh, uh, to the hospital or something, that order is right there. Um, some people keep stuff under the mattress back in the backyard. Uh, a number of people use the safe deposit boxes at banks, okay? And that is a certainly a, um, uh, an old standby. Uh, Andrea just mentioned the lawyer's office had had uh, the records. So that came in helpful, but you have to catch them while the lawyer's office is open and before they might destroy records or anything or lose them. Same way with the doctor's office or the local hospital. I just attended a section, uh, an all day session on palliative and hospice care. And many people give these documents to the facilities and after an episode, they are largely tossed aside. So uh, you, a lot of people give them to the hospitals, the doctors, the services, and think, oh, well, you got it. And the answer is, we don't know where it is, if we still have it at all. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, some people give it to their healthcare agent. You're the one who is, it was called to act upon uh, at the time. You should have the document. Um, some people make copies, uh, digital copies on their home computer, on their smartphone. That's another popular one is to make pictures of it and have it. Sometimes that will work, sometimes not. Um, online, in the cloud, or in a document bank, such as DocuBank. So let's look just a little bit at, at where we're going with this. Um, a safe deposit box is, if we're looking for the secure angle, I would say that a safe deposit box is your most secure. And over many years, uh, when I was practicing law for 40 years, I oftentimes recommended that as the, as the ideal for the security and safety. Now, it, you know, the bank could be blown over in a tornado, but typically speaking, we would keep the originals in safekeeping in a safe deposit box. And that would be the originals, and that would be the backup copies of those working originals that we were talking about. Um, because the safe deposit box generally is gonna provide the best protection from these varying dangers that we've talked about. Fire, water theft, prying eyes, forgetfulness, et cetera. It's protected, but it's unavailable. So this only solves part of the problem. We know it's there for a backup, but what are we gonna do when we really need it? And that's where the DocuBank, the, the document banks come in. And that's where DocuBank comes in. And that's why we have chosen to offer that as a, as a benefit here uh, in the uh, Empowered Living Club. Um, DocuBank, uh, we're going to talk about how that works, et cetera, et cetera. It uses a wallet card. So if I go to the emergency room and they're looking at my billfold and they want to see my ID, et cetera, there's the wallet card for DocuBank. So they can get immediate access to my healthcare documents, whatever I've stored with DocuBank. Of course, those are gonna be stored electronically. Those are gonna be digital, but they're, they, are, they are recognized. So generally speaking, it's got the, the best, excuse me, the, can you go back to that? Yeah, the best availability, accessibility. So it's on tap all the time. There's no delay. Uh, you know, if you have it on your cell phone, you might have just a little few minutes less delay, or if you're carrying it on you, a copy, you might have a few minutes less delay but there's really essentially no delay. Uh, it's secure, it is protected from interlopers, it's legally recognized, and you know, you've got it organized. So in terms of the accessibility, the optimal is really uh, a, a, a tool such as DocuBank. It's the best combination of security and accessibility 
in any one storage option. However, we're really not recommending that you do just one storage option. You know, put it in the jar in the backyard. Uh, no, we're not doing that. Um, we're trying, we're really suggesting a belt and suspenders approach. So in the safe deposit box or something along that nature would be the originals, the non-working originals, the ones that um, we can keep in storage. Uh, and from the working originals, we make a copy of those, okay, a physical copy, all righty. That's what should be in the safe deposit box. And we should make arrangements that somebody, our agent or somebody can have get access to that in case we aren't able to do so because of our uh, illness or condition. DocuBank, okay? It should have a digitized copy essentially of all those originals so that they're available uh, pretty much uh, at, uh, at just a request, an immediate request. Um, your working originals, if you have uh, uh, pulse or things like that, any working originals, should either be kept on that refrigerator or on your person or wherever they need to be. There is some question as to the doc, as to the vaccination card for COVID, whether you need to be carrying an original on you or not, okay? Uh, and that's really not real, um, real defined, but I would certainly want a copy on, uh, on DocuBank and, and whatever. Um, uh, so, You'd want extra copies uh, where convenient, uh, but also relatively secure. So uh, a lot of people keep uh, records at home, their home business records. So they've got them at hand. They don't have to run to the safe deposit box. They don't have to contact DocuBank. They've got them, okay? Or they might put them on their computer. Uh, or they put them on their smartphone, okay? So you got digitized copies there. So we recommend a belt and suspenders approach, uh, utilizing more than one uh, uh, tool so that we can really maximize what all we want there. Um, it doesn't stop there in terms of DocuBank. DocuBank has expanded from its original question. It's grown to include more, which includes a separate vault, or I think Gail says they call them a safe, for non-healthcare documents. So you've got two of them. You can have you can have your healthcare documents in one, and you can have your business and financial or legal documents in another. So they're all stored and they all can be accessible. Your business documents aren't going to be available to the hospital emergency room. Okay. And generally speaking, your medical records aren't going to be available immediately to your, to your business advisors. So that's the reason for that, uh, that kind of a split. But both vaults are included, or both safes are included in that same basic subscription price. So um, it's, it's, it's a pretty good thing. Uh, next slide, please. So how does DocuBank work? And we're turning to Gail since she has uh, much more experience with actually making it work than I do. Thank you, Jamie. Um, when I was working with the law office, I was the person responsible for setting up the DocuBank accounts for the Home Run Club members. And so I have worked with, I have my own account and I have worked with setting up other people. Uh, it's really incredibly easy. It starts with, uh, let me, I gotta do the slides too here. Uh, it starts with emailing or contacting um, the DocuBank people. You set up uh, answering a questionnaire that they give you. It basically includes your contact information and who your first and second emergency contacts are. Then you fill out some really basic uh, medical information, allergies. Are you allergic to penicillin, sulfa, latex, peanuts? And it gives you a few other options to fill in there. Then it asks about permanent medical conditions, Alzheimer's, um, arthritis, asthma, diabetes, heart disease, high blood pressure, stroke history, cancer survivor, and then you get to list a couple of more. And it also gives you 45 characters that you can include other pertinent healthcare information. So if those general categories don't cover it, uh, maybe you're a transplant 
person and you need them to see that first. You know, you would put in there kidney transplant. Um, so that these are the things that are the first thing that doctors generally need to know. So that would show up first. Then there's a medication list. The medication list does not show up on your card. As you can see on the card, and here is a, a, a sample of one. You've got your member number, your PIN number, um, the emergency contacts. Here's the first contact, their cell number, home number, work number, and a note that they are the healthcare power of attorney. Here's your allergies, penicillin and sulfur, sulfa, and uh, conditions, diabetes and asthma. Then medication list is on file. To get that, they actually have to log in and get more information. The card is the immediate information. This is accessible 24 seven every day of the year. It's an online, uh, you can call and talk to someone, they can log in online and get the information that they need on you personally. The medication list, you complete all this information. You can update it at any time because you just log into your personal account and you update your, your medication list. Carry the card in your wallet. Uh, you can present it to the staff. Now, most of the time, if you're going to the hospital, you know, you know one of the first things they're gonna ask is, what medications are you taking? You usually remember nine out of 10, maybe six out of 10. You know, you usually forget something. So there again, that list is helpful because that one that you forgot may be the one that's important for them to know. So you can refer to that. When you give them the card, the hospital then calls the 800 DocuBank number and it will um, there, there are the directives will be faxed, which will tell the the hospital who are the healthcare powers of attorney. Who's your first power of attorney? How do they get a hold of them? If they can't get a hold of them, who's the backup? That information is all there, and then they can also go in to the DocuBank.com and print the directives uh, if they if fax is not an option. The service is monitored any time of the day. So uh, just because it's the middle of the night doesn't mean you're out of luck. They can still help out. Once you get in there, they can also log in to the online and get the more descriptive medical information. Now you can be proactive if you want. If you know you're going into the hospital for something, you can print out your healthcare directives. You can print out all that information, take it with you to the hospital. You don't have to go hunting. You don't have to go to your safe deposit box. You know that it's all available on DocuBank so that you can just print it out at home and take that with you ahead of time. The DocuBank will send emergency medical information so the doctors can provide you with the best treatment. They provide the emergency contacts, your lists of allergies, your medical conditions, your primary care physician, and your list of medications. Now, again, if you have something unusual, um, I do know several people that have had transplants of one type or another, and that requires specialized care that also will be on this information. Now, obviously, if you're conscious and you go to the hospital, if your spouse is with you and they know that, they're going to provide that information. But if they are not with you, who is your voice? And DocuBank can be your voice for you. Especially in the midst of the pandemic when no one could go in with you. Right. I, I fought that battle with... Uh, a sister who went to the hospital and they would not let me in with her. So I had to work from a different area of the hospital providing information to them. In fact, folks, uh, the hospital called security on Yale. So uh, I consider that a there. badge of honor. That's a badge <laughs> of honor that I was 
And I was advocating so strongly that the security guy came around and said, uh, do we have an issue here? <laughs> I said, yeah, you won't let me in. <laughs> okay, when you log into DocuBank online, you log into the website, uh, you can add to your medication list, you can update your allergies, your medical conditions, or your emergency contact information. Um, maybe your first agent has gotten a new cell phone and changed numbers. Well, you'd want to make sure you updated that so that they have the most current number available. And there is also a DocuBank safe. Now, the first part of DocuBank, it was originally created for medical. So the first part, the doctors can only get into the medical part. But it is also important to have a safe place for other documents and that could be misplaced and you will need. The DocuBank safe is only accessible by you and those that you give permission to. So the healthcare can't get into that, can't go past that wall into that half of DocuBank. Uh, one of the things that I have suggested to people to upload into their DocuBank, obviously their uh, powers of attorney, their will, their trust, their um, anything like that. Some have uploaded their deeds to their house, but a big one for veterans is to upload your DD-214. Uh, a lot of veterans put them on file at their county courthouse, and so they're there. A lot of them were stored in St. Louis. There was a fire and destroyed all of the records there. And so there's a period of veterans that do not have access to their, their actual DD-214. Instead, the military has come up with a, here is the substitute version. Uh, so if you have that, and that's something you need, or naturalization papers, oh my gosh, is that important to have? Upload all of that into your DocuBank, and you don't have to worry about misplacing it when you move um, or anything like that, if you ever need your your papers for that, you have access to that. Birth certificates, marriage certificates. All of those. Um, okay, the login instructions. When you go to the DocuBank website, you click on member services tab. And that is, you'll log in, you've got your, your number and your PIN on your card that you receive in the mail. And that comes eh, a week or two after, after you've registered. And I pulled mine out, uh, out of my billfold, getting ready for today's call. And I realized, oh, I have an old card in my billfold. It expired in August of 2020. And I haven't put my new card in. So I'm checking on that to see why I haven't put my new card in, get another one. But it does have, you know, Jamie listed his cell phone, his home phone, the home phone, office phone, and my medical conditions. And then on the back side of the card, it says attention healthcare providers, use this card to obtain my information, call and there's a number, or go online and there's the website, use the member number and pin from the other side of this card and follow all the prompts to receive my information instantly. And then you sign it, which is giving them permission to actually use that. I have also found working with the people at DocuBank, um, they're all real people. And they're all real people here in the US that speak English. Um, so that you don't have that language barrier that you often have when you're dealing with somebody that's stationed in, I don't know, some country overseas. Um, they're very, very easy to work with and very, very accommodating. When you log in, you've got your member number on your card. You're gonna put that number in, your, your PIN number, and then you're gonna make a personal password that you'll know, and that gets you into your information. From there, you can upload all of your, your medications, any other information you want. Now, there are a couple of different versions of DocuBank cards. Uh, 
The standard version is for those of us that are basically responsible for our own lives. But there, the optional versions, there's a minor version. Uh, think about it if you are the grandparent that often watches your grandchild and something happens, they fall, you've got to rush them to the ER, you don't have any permission. They don't have to listen to you. They don't have to talk to you unless you're running around carrying some kind of permission form from the parents of the child. So with this DocuBank for minors, again, you would give them the card. It would, they would pull down the information that says that the parents had given you temporary custody, temporary medical uh, consent, um, who, who can act on behalf of their child when the parent is not available. And that information is immediately available if you need to take that grandchild to um, the ER. Um, the DocuBank ICE, um, and the in case of emergency, that's what the ICE is. This is for your teens uh, that are off at college and even young adults. And they carry the card, something happens, uh, and they need help. Who are they going to call? If they've got the card, it goes up to DocuBank and it tells them to call you as the parent to because you are the power of attorney if they're over 18. If they're under 18, you're still the you're the natural power as being the parent. It will have the basic medical information for that child and um, you then can talk with them. And this is going to come up in a minute when we give you Kathy's story. There is also a special needs program. If you have a special needs person in your family, um, that is not going to be, say, an accurate reporter. Uh, that sounds like they're trying to falsify it, but no. Um, I know I have a special needs sister. And, you know, she can come in and, you know, she'll be complaining to me. And so we go to the doctor and you, and the doctor asks, how are you? Well, I'm okay. I'm fine. Any, any problems today? Nope. And she just she doesn't remember what to report and uh, how to report it. You have to phrase the questions in a certain way to get the answers. So she doesn't go to the doctor by herself. She has one of the sisters go with her because we help then remind and question her in a way that we're going to get a more accurate answer from her. And we also remember the history. If she had a DocuBank card and she was taken to the hospital without one of us being with her, it would give the healthcare power of attorney, the medical information, uh, a letter of intent. It would have all the information that the doctors would need to start treating her. It's real service for real people. There's a non-emergency customer service number and then there's the emergency number. And, and I can vouch for the fact that they are very friendly customer service representatives answering the phone. Um, they really are there and helpful. Uh, they will also send you reminders uh, if you have something that needs to be updated in a timely fashion. They're going to send you reminders to do that. If you have not um, mail, if you haven't updated all of your information, you sent in to apply, but you only had half the information, they'll contact you back and say, okay, you didn't fill out your primary care physician. We need that contact information. And they'll remind you gently until you get that information to them. And Jamie, are you doing the Kathy Knit story? Yeah, I am. Uh, before I do, though, uh, Andrea had uh, made a comment uh, about just how some of the things that kind of go along with that that she thought was going to be helpful in. Did you want to bring that up, Andrea? Oh, yeah. As I was listening to this, um, there were two points that hit me immediately. One with the medication list, 
I was a consultant for almost seven years in long-term care and then an additional four years for, as a faculty member. And when you were talking about the med lists, it is, it's not surprising, but eye drops, inhalers, respiratory inhalers, or anything topical, when you talk about the medications that don't get picked up in an acute situation, because of course they're focused on blood pressure or maybe hemorrhaging or stroke, but if you have glaucoma, the number of people that would have been fully hospitalized for possibly a week and then end up in long-term care, and then they would mention, oh yeah, I have glaucoma, but I haven't had my drops in a couple of weeks. It was all because it was forgotten at the hospital. Nobody ever asked them. And so I think that having that med list, being able to update that is, is crucial. And then I was also thinking about autism. Um, a lot of individuals, and you kind of touched on that with the SNAP feature, but you, there's lots of people that are independent, but they may have communication challenges. And when I was thinking of autism um, or maybe just some of those communication barriers, how being able to use this could help at least know, uh, bring in an awareness to the care providers that they may need to bring in some other support staff. There might be other techniques that would be useful to help. So I think it's a brilliant concept. Yeah, and I think that those are, uh, those are great points too. So thank you. Um, we've gotten to something we call Kathy's story and Kathy does have a story somewhat uh, similar to Andrea's. Uh, Kathy is, uh, uh, has been with us. Uh, she's been with Boulder Care since it started about 14 years ago. And she's been working with me for over 20 years. So um, we know each other pretty well. She's under the weather today though. So I've got her story here. If you move to the next slide, it's the next two slides, this is it. So uh, briefly, um, and, and Gail alluded to this, um, parents are the natural guardians of their minor children. Okay, they can take their children to the doctor, to the emergency room, they can get all the information and they make the decisions, okay? Generally on the date of, of majority or emancipation, which is generally today about the 18th birthday, the child becomes an adult. And on that very day, the parent loses all rights to information and all rights to make decisions. And so knowing that, because Kathy has worked in the field for years, she insisted that both of her sons come in and have their powers of attorney, particularly their healthcare power of attorney, done on their 18th birthday. <laughs> and they named her and, and her husband and whatever. So uh, that's what she did with her son, Tyler. He went to college. He went on a trip to Florida. Uh, while he was in Florida, uh, he, was, he stepped on a stingray, okay? And it just so happened that some, um, uh, you know, then, then they took him to the hospital. Some people from here were, uh, were down there. They got him to the hospital and he called his mother, but he was, uh, could hardly talk. Uh, and um, uh, so as a result, uh, she wondered what was going on. And uh, he handed it to the phone to a nurse and all she could tell her, his mother was, you know, he, 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 he'll be okay. Uh, but she wouldn't speak further because he is an adult, okay? I cannot talk to you. And uh, Kathy doesn't put it in the story here that she said it quite that way, but she says, uh, you know, I said, oh, yes, you can. I have a healthcare power of attorney, which allows you, of course, to speak to me and I will fax that to you. And I happen to have access to it here on, she was working in the law firm at that time, in the law firm uh, computers. So uh, she got a fax number from the lady and she then had the documents on file, as we say. So could I have the next uh, slide? So she called back the hospital to find out what's going on. Uh, well, it turned out, as we say, that he'd had the sting and uh, that uh, uh, some people happened from, from our locale, a big outfit from Tri-City Electric in Davenport, they had a big yacht down there and they were where Tyler was. And so they made sure that he got to the hospital and uh, it was just happenstance that that happened. But he, you know, he had some paralysis uh, from the stingray venom and great pain. And so they gave him morphine as well. So he was pretty much out of it. His mother really didn't need to make any decisions for him uh, because the, 
medical treatment was pretty straightforward and was what they needed to do. But uh, she wanted to know what was going on to uh, her baby boy. And uh, without this, uh, she could not have done that. So as she says in the last sentence here, I generally tell this story to emphasize the importance of having a healthcare power of attorney, or at least a HIPAA release so we can get this information. And she also tells the story to emphasize that you need it from your 18th birthday on. But as she says here, you know, this ties in beautifully as well with the whole accessibility question. Okay. So if, uh, if he, if they had, and if he had the, the uh, DocuBank and he had the sticker on his driver's license and his healthcare uh, card, then they could have contacted DocuBank found that immediately and she wouldn't have had to scramble and she could have talked to them probably on her first conversation. So um, you can see that, you know, Andrea and Kathy have both experienced some real uh, medical emergencies that way. And, and uh, it really strikes home, I think, uh, just how valuable uh, and, and more likely than we might like to think uh, this, this service is. Um, as I said earlier, this is an educational presentation. We're talking about how to store documents. We're not trying to sell anything, although there's all this information about DocuBank. What we've done, I think many of you already know, but what we've done is we have, we have made an arrangement with DocuBank. It's one of our first valuable offers in the Empowered Living Club, okay? So uh, as we say in Empowered Living, we wanna make sure that we are empowering you with resources. And the second thing is we, we have some group buying power. So you can get resources uh, at discounted rates. And this one happens to be a, a pretty spectacular uh, example. Not all discounts are gonna be uh, like this, but um, you can purchase, it, it, and you don't have to purchase document. You don't have to use document, okay? It's strictly up to you. Now, there are people who are members of the Empowered Living Club, uh, and you heard Gail reference it. There is an organization in Ben Beagle's law office called the Home Run Club. People who are members of the Home Run Club automatically are members of the Empowered Living Club. If they want to use DocuBank, the DocuBank subscription is, in, is included in their subscription to the Home Run Club. But everybody else who's not in the Home Run Club can join the Empowered Living Club and get the discounted rate on, on DocuBank. So DocuBank is $55 per person per year. You can buy it, you can buy it online, okay? Uh, that's your retail price. But we have a special group price of $18 a year, which is, is a, a pretty steep discount. All of these monies go to document. We're getting no commissions, no kickback. We're not benefiting uh, at all, certainly directly from this. Uh, and uh, really, it's just a matter of, you know, we want people in the Power Living Club because we want to empower them. And also, you know, we want to make sure they know about our services. So that's how Empowered Living helps us. So the DocuBank though, as I say, we don't get any of that. It's strictly a benefit of the Empowered Living Club that is made available to the club members, okay? Uh, and let's take a look at the next slide if we can. So here's a little case study. Uh, so you have an individual, they can buy uh, the DocuBank at 55 bucks or a couple could buy it at $110. Um, the club membership right now, uh, for those who aren't familiar, is uh, $10 annually. Uh, that's an introductory rate. It will go up uh, over the next couple of years. But introductory rate is $10. So if you figure it's worth $10 a person, and we had one person in one of the presentations we were making say, well, this is easily worth $100 you know, uh, a, a year. But the annual dues for the club are $10 a person. Okay, so if you add that up, the value is, you can see the value there, 65 for an individual, 130 for a couple. But if you go down to the discounted rate, you see it's $18 for a person or 36 for the couple. There's the discounted rate. We also discount the club membership for the second person in a couple. 
So instead of $20 for a couple, you can see the club membership is $15. You want to show that, Gail? Yeah, there you go. So for club membership, a couple can get in at 15 bucks. So if you've got a couple here and they pay 15 bucks to get in the club and they pay $36 uh, for DocuBank for a year, they've spent a total of $51 for this $130 value. So they've saved much more than they've spent. So this is just one resource that we are making available to people. Uh, and it's part of what we're compiling as part of the club. And, and as I've been happy to uh, uh, briefly introduce you to today, uh, we have human resources as well. And Andrea and the Golder Care people are all part of uh, that. So we want to make these resources available to people. And we will talk more about that uh, as time and goes on. And before you move on to Andrea, uh, with DocuBank to start the process, I would need to send some basic information off to DocuBank uh, for you, and then and then you would get it set up. So I would need to just know who is interested and who is not, and to get that process started. Right. So you can be members of the club. You don't have to use DocuBank. You can be members of DocuBank. You don't have to join the club. Of course, you have to pay the retail rate. And you can be members of both, and you get them at, at uh, discounted rates, uh, which I think are well are, are worth far more than, uh, than the cost. So that's just uh, one piece that we have here. Uh, we do recommend it. Uh, I think you can see from the presentation today just how beneficial it can be uh, in this whole idea of will your uh, medical documents and will your medical treatment work when you need it to. And this is an enabling resource to make sure that that happens. And it's, a, and it's very reasonable. Uh, so we've really concluded our presentation uh, on how do you store legal documents? How do you make sure that uh, this is all available when uh, you need it. Uh, hopefully you have found that valuable uh, and the educational information. I mentioned that, uh, that obviously that was the main topic, uh, but uh, Andrea and we are talking about doing some further presentations together. Uh, and here are some things that Andrea has, has, has done over time. And, uh, and she has offered specifically, you see the last one there, discussion of drug treatments related to illnesses, et cetera, et cetera. I think she's got a lot of great information, great uh, educational information that will help empower uh, all of us, uh, whether uh, non-professionals or professionals alike uh, in, in, in moving forward uh, with, the, with the, uh, the mission of the club, which is to uh, empower us uh, as we uh, meet the opportunities and challenges of aging and of um, uh, caregiving. So here are some things, you know, that we have, and you can see uh, Andrea's background. So I think that um, if there's anything that particularly strikes any of you uh, that, uh, that uh, you, you think, oh, yeah, I really uh, will want to see that, let us know, okay? Uh, let us know for sure. But Andrea and we are working on some presentations uh, going forward as part of this education battery that we're doing um, for the club. Andrea, anything you want to say on this? Uh, I was just going to add, I'm, I'm really, thank you for sharing these. Um, I was contacted a few days ago um, by an organization in Maryland, and they were really interested about individuals that live with active illness or disability and travel health. And we were talking about how as an advocate, we sometimes forget that people will find themselves sidelined a little earlier, maybe because they see that level of effort or they might feel that it's a burden to family. And one of the things that I'm incredibly passionate about because of experiences with my mom, she had cancer that metastasized her brain, my father with dementia, um, I, and I've lived overseas and I travel extensively is that 
you know, it's not over until it's over. <laughs> and, and oftentimes there is a way. It's just, we have to think outside the box and, and, and frame that a little differently. And so I'm actually going to be doing this, that first uh, presentation to this group in Maryland as well. Um, and I also did it for another organization because that really, especially now with COVID starting to, to get manageable, people are out and about and, you know, they're realizing, you know, I still have time. I want to get out there. I just don't know how to pull this off. Um, oh. And so I've seen a lot of uh, success and interest in that first topic. Yeah. And, and uh, thank you because you then reminded me that uh, I had intended to say, you know, not only is Andrea a member of the, the club and, uh, and a, a, a participant and a professional participant and an and educational resource, but uh, in terms of working with her in the club and, and the Golder Cares uh, working with her, um, there are, there's, there's, there's three things that we certainly see. Uh, one, we can utilize her as a, um, uh, as a patient advocate um, at a distance, but uh, kind of like telemedicine, but uh, in terms of helping us with patient advocacy. Number two, because of her drug uh, background, her, her, her um, pharmaceutical background, um, you know, she's got a wealth of, of very highly uh, developed and specialized information that can help in all of those types of cases. And then this piece that is so interesting and somewhat unexpected, and that's this piece that Andrea was just talking about. Uh, she, she talks, she actively helps a number of people. She's the only resource I know of in the United States that does this to help people uh, for uh, strategies for traveling while they have uh, limitations like this. Yeah, it's it's so important. Um, we were just talking about it with my sister the other day and my niece. She's graduating from high school. My dad passed away last year. Um, it was pretty traumatic because he had a fall. And so, again, I've lived the whole advocacy piece. They didn't quite call the security on me, but I have a feeling it wasn't we weren't close or <laughs> we were close to it because, you know, they were trying to give him drugs that on the label clearly said not to give them. And yet it was part of protocol. Um, so you can imagine how that thinking win-win in that moment was was a struggle. Um, but my niece, as she's graduating, you know, she misses Gigi and, you know, he's gone and it's it's hard. But what I'm so thankful for is that even when it got to be pretty complex and it kind of took a village, you know, she will still in that moment where she's like, I miss him. But if you start talking to her, she's like, oh, but that time we took him to Florida and we watched the dolphins off the back porch. So while you could argue it's not like a happy, like there's, there's not a happy ending because he is gone. She immediately had that other memory to draw upon. And so it's almost like putting a little bit more in the deposit, you know, on the, on the positive side. So you're still going to have to navigate that loss, but there's more to draw upon, you know, and I, and that's why it's so important to me. And it, and it has been just to not feel sidelined earlier than it's necessary. So this ability to make special arrangements for people to travel and, and make special memories as, as they did for the family with your dad when he was, when he was having his uh, disabilities and, 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 and uh, difficulties. Um, I, I think it's very needed. Um, I'm, I'm very happy and proud, uh, you know, to offer that as a resource, you know, to hook you up with our uh, club and club members, uh, because I think that um, certainly there are going to be a number of people who will will want to delve into that a lot more. So, uh, I don't know. It is uh, we're at the one hour mark. So I would suggest what's the next uh, slide? Is it the last slide? If anyone has any questions. Um, why don't you, uh, you can either call us or send us a question uh, at that email address. Uh, and we'll be happy to, to address those. If you're interested in joining the club and you haven't yet done so, you may use that address as well. If you're interested in, in uh, uh, obtaining uh, the DocuBank uh, membership, uh, contact us as well, because that has to be done through the club. Um, but 
this was our first monthly meeting. Uh, the, the topic I think is, a, is an important uh, one and, and hopefully we gave you some uh, insight and some benefits uh, to how to deal with these issues that um, you may or may not have had uh, beforehand. Uh, for that, we thank you for coming to today's presentation. This will be uh, posted and uh, it will be available to you and others. Um, this one is available for free to the public. So they don't have to be a member of the club to watch this particular presentation. Um, I have that, been, what I have been doing with the presentations is um, I clean them up so it's, you know, they're concise, but then I post them on the Golden Care website. Uh, so you'll find them there uh, right now, I believe they're uh, in the not under empowered living, um, but you will, you'll find a spot that all of our presentations are right there together, but they are, they are on the website. Okay, and the website is further developing. And, uh, and I see uh, Andrea wished us all a, a good day as well. So um, with that, everybody, I think we'll draw to a conclusion and uh, thanks for joining us and we'll look forward to more of these.